It's so nice to be back. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come back here. Two, two years ago I was here and had a chance to share uh, some ideas with you about uh, landscapes and stress. And uh, the article that we, that we talked about in this body of research that we talked about just got accepted at the Journal of Landscape and Urban Planning and will be published in a couple months. Uh, today I'm going to show you uh, some research that's hot off the press. Actually, I was doing data analysis late last night and early, very early this morning to produce some of the graphs that you'll be, you'll be seeing. So um, we'll be looking at some um, information that's really uh, right off the, hot off the press. Actually, not even hot off the press, it's so new. Um, let me just say uh, also that it's really lovely to be back because um, Trace Forever is such an impressive organization, and this is an example of how impressive it is. Uh, I travel around the country and actually around the world talking about this research, and it's rare to find a nonprofit with uh, such deep roots in the communities that you work in and uh, that has such an impact um, that you've got. So congratulations, and it's really it's a pleasure to be back. It's also rare to find a mayor uh, who knows as much about green infrastructure as your mayor does. So congratulations on that, and, and um, thank you, Brad. Uh, I want to start off by providing a little uh, gratitude and thanks to people who have supported our research over the number of years, the U.S. Forest Service and the um, United States uh, National Science Foundation. Uh, as Brad said, our work and the work of my group and I uh, is based on trying to understand the health impacts of having everyday contact with green spaces. And I chose this uh, image. Where's Dan? Is he here? Because I thought he might appreciate this. Uh, there he is. Um, because um, healthy communities include not only nature, but many, many opportunities to walk and bike. And when we put these things together, we create the we create places in which I think people can really thrive, and we're going to hear more about that when Dan talks in a few minutes. This morning, I've organized my, my comments around a story that I want to create, and that story is um, that exposure, everyday exposure to urban green spaces have measurable impacts on our capacity or effectiveness to learn. And I want to tell that story looking at two um, things. I want to look at stress. And I want to look at our capacity to pay attention. Because if you're stressed out, you're not a good learner. And if you can't focus your attention, obviously you're not a good learner, right? My, my focus today is going to be on kids. But really, I think these findings can generalize to a, a bigger population. So my question for you is, as I'm giving you these findings and I'm talking to you about them, and I'm telling this story, who else do you think might uh, be impacted by the same kind of mechanism by exposing, uh, by having people be exposed to green spaces? All right. This is a school in Bloomington, Illinois. The school board in Bloomington liked this school so much that after they built it, they just took the same architectural plans and the same landscape plans and they built a second one. And when I went and saw this, I was dumbfounded. Does this support learning? Is this the kind of place that enhances the capacity of a child to learn? When you have a view out your classroom window like this, is that going to put you in the best spot possible to pay attention, or to recover from the stressful experiences that you've had uh, in the course of the day. <clears throat> I want to talk about this with respect to these two big ideas. First, stress, and second, uh, the capacity to pay attention. Uh, let me give you a little bit of background on both of these ideas, and talk about their impacts on learning, and then give you some examples from three, three quick studies, okay? So, when you experience a stress, whether it's from a, a traffic jam, or an unreasonable child, or an unreasonable mayor, <laughs> or, or even a spider, your body reacts in a very quick and an immediate fashion. What happens is your, your blood pressure rises, and your breath quickens, 
and your heart rate increases, and your senses become fine and sharp. These uh, physiological reactions prepare you to engage in whatever it was that was threatening. You can, um, you're, you're, uh, you can run faster, <laughs> you can jump higher, uh, or you can be more aggressive in the face of whatever that threat is. And if you're the, if you're the CEO of a nonprofit like Trees Forever, you're, you're ready to fight when you get in this kind of state. And if you're a professor, you're ready to run and you can get away quickly. <laughs> when, when you experience a stressor, when you perceive a stressor, you get, a, you get an immediate, within milliseconds, uh, stimul pretty strong stimulus in your hippocampus. And your hippocampus sends a chemical signal through your pituitary glands, which immediately send another signal uh, to your adrenal glands. Your adrenal glands sit right above your, your kidneys. And your kidneys secrete um, adrenal, or the adrenal glands uh, secrete cortisol and adrenaline. And those, um, those hormones are incredibly powerful. They help, um, they help you in the fight or flight uh, situation. And they also, if you get a wound, um, they help you deal with the wound in an effective in an effective fashion. The problem is, when you have a lot of cortisol in your bloodstream, or a lot of adrenaline in your bloodstream, you're not an effective learner. When you're all jazzed up because of some stressor that you just experienced, you're not in a good state to focus your attention, to take in the information that's coming to you, to consider how that fits with what you already know. You're much more jazzed for action than for contemplation uh, at that moment. This is a picture I took in my, uh, in my brother's backyard and, uh, a few weeks ago. He lives in Seattle, I was there in August. And I just thought to myself, boy, he must be a pretty unstressed person when he comes home. From, from work at night. Um, the fact is, philosophers and poets and insightful designers have been telling us for centuries that um, we can uh, remove ourselves from the stresses of the day and, and by returning to nature. And the original work was really about getting into wilderness and leaving the intensity of the city. But the emerging work that my group and my colleagues are doing around the world suggest that you don't have to take a wilderness vacation to experience pretty significant reductions in stress. That, um, that exposure to stress uh, to nature that comes from being on the golf course, being on a trail, being on the river walk, being in an urban setting that has street trees may have pretty significant impacts on our capacity to, to uh, feel stress reduction. So that's the first part of my talk. The connection between, there's empirical evidence that shows there's some connection between um, ex lower levels of stress or recovering quick, more quickly from stress and being exposed to green spaces. The second part of my talk, um, I want to I focus on uh, what Stephen and Rachel Kaplan call their attention restoration theory. Attention restoration theory is this very interesting theory that makes a connection between the landscapes or places that we build and design and spend our time in and our capacity to focus our attention. Attention Restoration Theory says that we've got two ways of paying attention. One is involuntary. It's very easy. Uh, it's, it, we, don't, we don't have a choice for this kind of um, paying attention. And the other is what we would call paying attention, directing our attention, deciding to focus our attention. Now we can look at these two kinds of uh, attention with respect to the amount of effort it takes. Let's, uh, let, me, let me just do a little um, example here. See this? Did it take, did you, did it take you any effort to, um, <laughs> Take you any effort to 
see this flying through the air and th then deciding that you had to focus your attention on it? No, it's, um, this is, that's in, if something, if, the, if something is flying through the air at your head, you, it's, um, you don't make a decision to pay attention to it. It just, it automatically happens. You just, you, you are immediately focusing in on it. Um, there are a number of things that are like this in our lives. Can you, can you name anything else that's, that would immediately grab your attention without you having to say to yourself, okay, I've got to focus on that. What else would be like that besides the, you know, baseball flying through the air? Your child about to fall off the couch. Your child about to fall off the couch. Excellent. What else? Ice on the road. Ice on the road. Well, hopefully if you see it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Lightning in the sky, right, yeah. Okay, what else? Loud noise, excellent. What else? Uh, waterfall, fire in the fireplace, birds chirping out the window. Um, how about this? Um, uh, let's say, some of our trees forever folks in the back. Wave your hands. Yeah. What if the, what if an argument broke out back there? <laughs> <laughs> would we be? What, how would it be to? Um, would we? Would it take us a lot of effort to turn our head and pay attention to that? No. We actually the effort that would be the socially difficult thing would be to continue paying attention, right, in, in the face of an argument. Uh, that, was, that was going on back there. So, um, voluntary, involuntary attention, the kind of attention that just grabs your, your focus, doesn't take any effort. Oops. Well, like this guy. I took this guy the other, uh, a few, last spring in uh, Pennsylvania, and I was thinking, what a um, effortlessly engaging task he's involved in, fly fishing in this beautiful river here. It takes him no effort to sit there and, and cast, intellectual effort to cast. It turns out, and this is the brilliance of the Kaplan's, it turns out that um, green spaces fall into the same category. Even urban green spaces fall into the same category. It seems that looking at a scene like this um, doesn't, doesn't require us to focus our attention in the way that paying attention does. So paying attention is distinct from this first kind of attention in that we have to focus our attention. It takes effort. Here's a dissertation I was editing uh, the other day. Uh, I, can, I get up in the morning and I work hard on writing and I often work with my, on, with my students. And you know, I've, I've got four PhD students. Uh, none of them are from the United States. They're, all of them are second language speakers, which is quite impressive, I think, to be able to write a dissertation in English. But it takes a lot of effort to edit it and go back and forth on the ideas. I can do this so well in the morning for a little while, uh, but I have to, but it takes, an, it takes effort. And I have to focus. You can also talk about these two kinds of attentions with respect to their capacity to fatigue. The first kind of attention, the involuntary attention, doesn't seem to fatigue. You can look at this you can look at this scene for a long time. You, after a while, you may need to do other things. You may, you may get um, bored, but you're not going to get tired from, from watching this. Um, but editing that dissertation, go oh, baby. I can only do that, you know, I have about a 90 minute period where I can do that during the day at a high level. And then I got to, then I just got to take a break. And after I take a break, I can come back, and I can probably do it again for a little while, but maybe only half as long. Um, so here's what happens when you focus your attention. When you focus your attention to pay attention to, to whatever it is at hand, you have to exclude from your consciousness two sources of information. The first source of information that you have to exclude is all the stuff going around in the world around you. So in order to have this proposal or the talk you're listening to or the grading you're doing or the speech you're working on, 
um, be the focus of your attention. You have to move out of your focus all the stuff that's going on in the, in the environment around you, the conversation on the hall, the siren on the street, the smell of somebody making popcorn in their office close by. You have to push all that stuff away. The second thing you have to do that's harder for me is you have to push out of your focus all the stuff that's running around your head at, the, at any one time. Like, don't forget to do this. How am I going to solve that problem? What, what am I going to do in this situation? Um, uh, all, all the things, you know, the 10 million things that are running around in your head all at the same time. So there's a mechanism in your brain that actually pushes that stuff away so you can focus on the thing at hand. But that mechanism fatigues with use. And the more demands you put on it, in terms of the amount of time that you use it, or the harder you have to work because there's all these conversations going around and you're trying to focus, the faster it fatigues. When you get fatigued attention, and I would, I would argue that we've created a society in which our attentional capacity is taxed repeatedly every single day. It's a rare day when you don't, uh, maybe week, on weekends maybe, but even on weekends for a lot of people who have to, have to deal with the complexities of managing large systems or large nonprofits and all the emails that you get all the time, you can get mentally fatigued. It seems like our society has created opportunities for us to be mentally fatigued a lot. I know I get mentally fatigued every single day. This is a problem because paying attention, our capacity to pay attention, is fundamental to every single thing that we care about in the world. Everything we care about is enhanced by our capacity to pay attention, and everything that we care about suffers when we're not good at paying attention. Let's take, let's take a look at some of the biggest issues. You, have, you can't learn without paying attention. You can't problem solve well without paying attention. You can't plan or carry out your tasks or initiate new tasks or even have new ideas about how to move forward without your capacity to pay attention. Um, you can't self-monitor. You can't self-regulate well. You can't, you're, mu you're significantly less likely to be able to inhibit that thought that's probably not a good thing to say out loud. When you're mentally fatigued, that thought is much more likely to come out of your mouth, which, which can be costly. In, in terms of effective social function, right? So, okay. So, what are some of the symptoms of mental fatigue? See if you notice any of these in, in yourself. I certainly notice them myself. First of all, when you're mentally fatigued, you can't focus. It's hard to focus, and your mind is all your mind is drifting, and you have to keep bringing it back and bringing it back. And the more mentally fatigued you are, the harder it is to bring it back, and the more often it is that it that it drifts off. Secondly, and this is not a given, it's not a, it's not a mathematical formula, but, but it is a probability, the more mentally fatigued you are, the more likely you are to be irritable. The more mentally fatigued you are, the more likely you are to do something that's impulsive. The more likely you are to grab onto something that seems attractive in the moment that may work against your long-term goals. Well, people that are mentally fatigued are much more likely to do things that are impulsive. So the Steve and Rachel Kaplan, their, one of their great insights was that green spaces, even green spaces in cities, have the capacity to rest our attention. Very much like the waterfall, uh, or a fire in the fireplace, or the birds at the bird feeder, when you look out on a green space, when I look out the window in the back, I'm not having to use that mechanism that pushes everything away. I give that mechanism a break. So if I look out the window for 30 seconds, that mechanism gets a break for, for 30 seconds. And the theory is that that small break or a series of small breaks across a day should, should be able to have a measurable impact on your capacity to focus your attention. So let, let me give you now, I'm going to go through three studies uh, right now and describe some of the research in this area and give you some pictures of some of the, the greenness of some of the places that uh, people have looked at. So the first study I want to talk about was published in uh, 2008 by Berman, Johnson, and Kaplan from the University of Michigan. 
they looked at 38 people and they had these people walk, walk in two conditions. And this was a within subject study. A within subject study is, a, is, a, is the kind of a study in which everybody does all the treatments. And then they're just randomly assigned to the order of the treatments. So in, in this case, uh, half the people came into the, uh, when, when, when people came into the laboratory to get tested, they, they flipped a coin, and if it was heads, they sent them on the walk to downtown Ann Arbor first, and if it was tails, they sent them to the Arbor even first. And then they came back a couple days later, they did some tests again, and whichever, whichever activity they did first, they, they did the other activity the second time. Does that make sense? It's a very, it's a very standard scientific technique. And then <clears throat> they tested their capacity to pay attention. So in this study, the question was, does having a walk in an urban setting uh, or a walk in, a, in the arboretum have an impact on your capacity to pay attention? And they did the time, one of the time-honored tests of paying attention. That's a standard neurocognitive measure of attention. It's a whole lot of fun. That's called digit span backwards. It goes like this. Okay, I'm going to say some numbers to you, and I'd just like you to say them back to me in reverse order. Are you ready? Three, nine, two. That's easy, right? Okay, so you start out with three digits, and you do three digits twice. And if they get those, if they do that correct, then you go to four digits. And you do that twice. And if they get correct, correct, you go to five digits. And they start feeling a little old. And you do that twice. You do that twice. And you go to six. And you keep going up to ten digits. It gets a very hard, very fast. So uh, they brought people into the lab. They had them do digits spin backwards. They got a test of their capacity right in the moment. Then they walked. Then half of them walked first in downtown. Arbor, which is not an ungreen place, <coughs> and the other half they walked in the University Arboretum, which is a very green place. The walks were consistent in terms of the amount of time and the um, topographic change and social connections and whatnot. Let me just make sure I'm on time. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is. Um, the number of trials that they got correct. So if they got the two trials at three correct, then they, that, that would be two trials correct. And if they got the two trials at, at four digits correct, that would be four trials correct. Um, so how did they do before they went on the walk? They got a little more than seven uh, correct. So did walking in downtown Ann Arbor improve their capacity to pay attention? If it did improve, would the bar be higher or lower? Higher, right? You're paying attention. Good. Okay. Do you think the bar is higher? Well, oops, wrong way. The bar is, in fact, not statistically higher. The number is a little higher, but uh, with only 38 participants, you can't say that the differences that they got were statistically significant. So walking in downtown Ann Arbor was the same as not having to walk at all. Okay. How about walking in the Arboretum? Cha-ching, yeah. Making a 40-minute walk in the Arboretum had a significant boost on attentional capacity. Is that my timer? Okay, so um, this is Dong Yun Lee. Dong Ying is a PhD student of mine. She's a brilliant young woman. She's just about to finish her dissertation. And I want to tell you a little bit about one piece of her dissertation work. She, uh, she thought, she and I taught a class together. And one day after class, the students left and we were sitting in the classroom. We were talking about various studies that we went to. And we, and we thought, gosh, you know, there's a kind of a natural experiment that, it, that can occur with the um, density of vegetation around schools and the ways in which students have contact with green spaces in, in the schools that they work in. So we decided to do this study. And we ended up, we looked at three different spaces in five, three different classrooms 
in five different schools. This is one of the types of classroom. How would you classify this classroom with respect to windows? Yeah, no windows. In Illinois, I'm sure Iowa's a lot better than this, but in Illinois, it's very easy to find a high school with no win with, that has classrooms with no windows. In fact, it's very, very typical to find uh, classrooms with no windows. So that, so that was no problem. So that was one of the categories, classrooms with no windows. And the second category, was this, classrooms with windows that looked out onto built spaces. So you could see from your window out onto, uh, in this case, across a little pathway or courtyard to uh, another portion of the school. Um, or you looked out onto a courtyard that had no vegetation into it, also to another, to a gymnasium or something like that was connected. And then the third classroom was a classroom kind of like this. Um, that had a window that looked out onto a green space. In this case, this building, I think, was designed, this high school was designed by a frustrated naval architect, a person that always wanted to build warships with those tiny little windows where the guns would stick out. So we had, to, we had to smash the desks right up against the wall and do the experiment against the wall so that students could actually look out the window uh, during the experiment. It, it, it's amazing how you know, you start looking at schools and windows, and you, you see the really interesting and kind of crazy things that happen um, uh, in terms of opportunities to get connected to nature. Okay, so these are the three categories. And we had these five different high schools, and in each high school, we had three different kinds of classrooms. We brought students into the high school that they went to over the summer. So they were going to the, a familiar place, and the first thing that we, that we, they signed some forms uh, about participation, and then they were randomly assigned right at that moment to go to one of the one of these three kinds of classrooms. We got some baseline measures of their physiological functioning and their capacity to pay attention, and then we did some really fun academic activities with them. We gave them a 10 minute break in the classroom, and then we, we uh, took those uh, attention and stress, stress measures again. There were 94 students that participated in, in this work. So let me give you a sense of the um, academic activities. The first thing that we did is we brought these high school kids in, uh, and we said to them, okay, we'd like you to make a, uh, a five minute speech on your dream job. And they did this dress in, they did this speech in front of two people dressed in lab coats uh, who just looked at them. <laughs> didn't give them any affirmation, didn't nod their heads and smile, just pay attention. Which for some people is this can be a very stressful experience. Uh, the next thing that we did is we had to, we asked them to do some proofreading, uh, which can really drain your attention. Capacity. We asked them to find um, uh, certain errors in, uh, in a 10-page text. We timed them and we told them that we're going to keep track of the number of errors that, we, that they found or didn't find, which we didn't really do, but we wanted to give them a little feeling of pressure of time. And then we asked them just to, just to have a lot, you know, knock it right over the edge. We asked them to do the subtraction test, uh, and this subtraction test lasted for five full minutes. And they did this subtraction test without the help of any pencil or paper or calculator. We said, take the number 4,029 and subtract 13 from that. And then when you get the answer to that, subtract 13 again. And when you get the answer to that, subtract 13 again and just keep going. And we'll already begin. And so they would say 4,029 and then they'd say, 4,016, and then they'd say 4,003. And if they made an error, we'd say, oh, that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and we'd ask them to repeat, the, the, you know, fix the error, and then go on. They did this for five full minutes. I've done this in front of my graduate students when they were not even, they, were, they weren't even dressed in their lab coats. And it's very stressful. <laughs> I found it to be very stressful. 
Okay, so then the attention measures. We did digits forward, which is simply, uh, I'll say a series of numbers to you, and you just repeat it back. So I would say seven, six, four, and you would say, right? And then we did the digits backwards, which is just in reverse order. Then we did the uh, color stroop. Have you ever done the color, uh, the, the stroop? The stroop is a fun little test. Um, give them, you, give a, you put a piece of paper on the table and you say, okay, now what we want you to do is uh, read these 50 words and We'd like you to read them kind of fast. You got 30 seconds, and you got a whole page of them. So people read the words. They read. Everyone does very well on this. You know, high school students in America, or at least in Illinois, they're pretty good at this. They can read these. They can read these numbers. They don't. They rarely make errors. And you, the fact you time them a little bit, so they're focused on doing it kind of quickly, which is easy. So what we've actually done by doing this is we've primed them to do something they're good at and it comes easy to them, to, to read these words. And we take that piece of paper back and we put another piece of paper in front of them and we say, okay, this time we want you not to read the meaning of the word, but we want you to say for each word the color of the ink. Ready? Go. I'm pretty good at this, <laughs> but I gotta tell you, when when you said yellow, I said no, it's blue. People have done this a million times. Um, so what happens is um, our brains are trained, and we're really good at reading the words, and it takes a couple of milliseconds longer to um, to process the color and say the color, and. Um, what happens if you're mentally fatigued, you're going to have a strong impulse to say the first thing that jumps into your mind, which is very often the, the, the meaning of the written word. And if you're less mentally fatigued, you're going to be able to inhibit that impulse and say the color of the ink. So it's a really nice test of uh, the capacity to be mentally fatigued. So then we ask, we simply ask, you know, when, when students have these, um, different kinds of views to green spaces, does it have an impact on their capacity to learn, to pay, to pay attention? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna show you results of the digits forward uh, exercise. And uh, for those of you guys in the back, you can't really see as well, the, these are just the, the numbers. Uh, and the, the better they did, the taller the bars are gonna be. Or the, the taller the line, the higher up on the scale the line will be. And we're gonna look at two periods. Right after they did the classroom activities, so they did those 30 minutes of classroom activities, the proofreading and the speech and the subtraction. And then they had a 10 minute break in that room and we tested their capacity to pay attention again. So that's, the, that's gonna be the same. And we're gonna look at three conditions. The blue line is gonna be the kids who were randomly assigned to the no window classrooms. And the yellow line is gonna be the kids that had the window view but no vegetation and the green line is going to be the kids that had the views of well, classrooms with windows looked down to a green space. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's the question. Did having a win no window have any impact across the break? What do you think? No. In fact, there was no impact, no measurable impact whatsoever on the kids in the no window condition. It was as though the break did not occur. In fact, that's what the data show us. There was no impact of a break in a windowless room on your capacity to pay attention. Well, maybe that's, well, what, do you think? what, about, the, what about the kids that had the, at least the sunlight was coming in? How did they do? Yeah, somewhat increased, right? That's certainly what I thought. And I was wrong. There was no measurable difference for the kids that had the views to a brick wall but the sunlight was coming. What about the kids that had a green view? Yeah, they did significantly better. A significant increase in their capacity to pay attention. Okay, 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 okay. Digits four is pretty easy, right? Digits, what about digits backwards? 
How did they do with respect to digits backwards? So we'll do the same thing, the same categories here, right? So the kids in the no window condition, how'd they do? Same, no, no statistical differences before or after. Same with the kids that, didn't, that had the sunlight come in but no uh, vegetation. And the kids that had the green view, once again, statistically significant differences. Let me point out a couple things here. During the ta at the end of the tasks, they weren't different. And at the end of the classroom breaks, in both cases, in both of these measures, they were in fact different. So it was the it was the break itself, and not the task, not not being in the room, the green room that, that's in the back. Okay, what about the um, what about the stroop? We did the stroop only once. You do the stroop uh, only once because people learn pretty quickly. You, it's it's suffer. It's a it's not a good measure to use in a repeated fashion. So you do use it just once. So I'm going to show you the fail count, the number of errors that they had. So a taller bar is, represents poor performance. And we're going to look at the no window, the barren, and the green condition. Ready? Predictions? So they made about two and a half errors over the 50 uh, in the no window condition. How'd they do in the barren condition? Well, I thought it was a good same too, but it was a little better. It was statistically better. How about in the green condition? Shannon! <laughs> Look at that! Almost 10 times fewer errors than in the no window condition. Why are we sending any of our kids to classes with no windows in them? It has an impact on their capacity to pay attention. Okay. We did the physiological measures, too. We hooked them up to this. This is the ProComp 5. It's a clinical grade physiological measuring tool. We measured their heart rate variability, their blood pulse volume. We looked at their skin conductance and their skin temperature, all kind of gold standard measures of stress. We asked the same question. Did the impact of the views have an impact on their capacity uh, to recover from the stressful experiences? So what I'm going to show you, because I've because I'm greedy and I want to tell you another study, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly. I'm going to show you the um, change. How much they changed in terms of the amount of stress, physiological stress they were showing, from before the break to after the break. If they had less stress after the break, we'll see a positive, we'll see a, a bar that goes above zero. If they were just as stressed, we won't see a bar at all. And if they were a little bit more stressed, the bar will be in the negative zone. Does that make sense? All right. So the kids in the no window condition, after a 10 minute break, they were just about as stressed as they were with, before the break. Not different. The kids in the barren condition were, were statistically more stressed after 10 minutes. And the kids in the green condition, it's a chain, once again. Not, they were significantly less stressed. They had a significant recovery from the stressful experience when they had views to green spaces. The difference of having a window view that looked out onto a green space like this on the capacity of a student to pay attention, when you look at our attention measures alone, was the equivalent of taking a dose of Ritalin the change in scores. If you give a kid a dose of Ritalin, you're going to expect they're going to have an increase in their capacity to do these kinds of measures, 15 to 20 percent. And we got 17 percent increases by having green views. That's a clinical dose of Ritalin by giving them a view of, of, of trees. That suggests to me, Shannon, that the work that you do every day to green communities has a whole lot, does a whole lot more than reduce the urban heat island impact, than, than, than provide shade, than provide handsome views, than attract people to your downtown areas. It may, it may be a very important predictor of the capacity of children to function effectively in schools. But you know what the problem is? Here, at, this is a picture of the quad at the University of Illinois. Yes? Yeah, so, very interesting. Where, where these schools, uh, they were, they were, 
kid, high school students who are randomly assigned to those conditions. So they are, you are changing them? In they, <coughs> each child was in one group. They were randomly assigned. Yes. yes. They were randomly assigned to. So this is a standard dose response clinical uh, uh, experimental design in which we can claim causality at the green space on, on the outcome measures that we have. <coughs> I mean, I'm concerned about the bias. Uh, no, there's no bias here. No. The, it, because of random assignment. Because of random assignment you choose. And also, uh, in this paper, this is the paper that's coming out in a few weeks in landscape and urban planning. But we've got a whole, we've got all these supplementary data that you could explore if you'd like to. It'll be available on the website. So we looked at all kinds of standard you know, were the kids coming in the, did, even though we had random assignment, did we get unlucky and get all the um, slow learners to get in the know the condition? No, we didn't. We didn't have any, we, we didn't find any statistical significant differences between the groups before the experiment. Okay? Okay, so here's the problem. This is the University of Illinois campus. It's a, it's a gorgeous campus, full of green spaces. And, um, this is how so many of our students enjoy those green spaces today. They go out there like this. <laughs> Whoa, excuse me. They're just, they are so intensely wired. And, you know, the work, there's this, there's this notion that, you know, maybe exposure to green space is a good idea. So that they're hearing about this, and I'm talking about it on campus, my students are talking about it, the word is getting out, so they're going out there. And this is what they're doing. So we did this little study. We asked, we asked, are green landscapes still restorative in spite of technological engagement? Is that, in other words, you get a benefit from being in a green space while you're texting, doing your email, looking at YouTube, and doing Facebook. So we did this little experiment. We got four categories. We put people into barren spaces and to green spaces, and we had them either use their laptop or not use their laptop to, um, uh, to take a break. To take a break. So we had them come into the, uh, well, I'll just tell you we had about we had pretty even distribution of students um, in, in each of these four categories. They were ran once again they were randomly assigned to these categories. Each participant did only one category. So here's here's what we did. We brought them into the uh, the, the description here. It's going to highlight. So we had an introductory phrase. We brought people into uh, a classroom space. We got a bunch of baseline data from them. Uh, and then they took these attention tests. This, this is the, uh, they just backwards, they just forwards. Uh, it's just so much fun. Uh, then we gave them a proofreading task. In this task, we asked, we give them this, um, this incredibly awful uh, sheet of paper. It's so miserable. I can't believe that the University Internal Review Board allowed us to, to do this. The students went and then leave us and then go to class. We, so here's the assignment on this one. And this is a standard test used in thousands of uh, studies to degrade people's capacity to atten pay attention. You ask them to look at the first three or four letters. In this case, we ask them to look at the first three letters in the line and then see if they could see those letters in the, in the same sequence in the rest of the line. And then you go to the next line, and you have to circle all the ones that you see. And then you go to the next line, and you look at the first three letters in the second line, and you do the same thing. Now this is incredibly cognitively demanding. First of all, you've got to memorize the first three letters, and you've got to see if they're in, this, in the sequence. And then you have to dump that information out of short-term memory and gain, um, and put the new sequence in. So it's, 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 it guarantees the great. Then we did the attention test again. Then we gave them a 15 minute break outside in which they were either using their laptop or not using their laptop. And then we did the, we brought them back in and we did the attention tests again. So here's, here's what we thought. Based on the previous literature, we thought, well, being in a barren space with your laptop, that's gotta be awful. 
in terms of your capacity to pay attention. And from the previous research, being in a green space and not having your laptop, that's got to be pretty good. So that's our hypothesis that we're going to have two categories here, but we had no idea what these two things were. And this is where it's important because this is what the students are doing right now. So we wanted to see if we can figure this out. So I'm going to show you the results. Very similar to last time. I'm going to give you the summary attention scores from all the different t attention tests that we've got. And we're going to look at before the rest, after they did the academic activities, and then after the rest. We're going to look at the barren laptop condition first. So if they would, did better after the rest, the line would be up. Okay, barren laptop, what do you think? Yeah, no difference. How about the barren with no laptop? No difference. You can't say there's a difference there. How about the green space of the laptop? At least they were in a green space, right? What do you think? It was identical to the Baron with laptop. No, I mean, the space didn't matter. How about green, no laptop? Once again, a significant and profound impact of the green space on capacity to pay attention. Okay, so we also compared the groups. You know, we wondered if these, if these three are um, in not supportive places, what's the impact of looking at, how do, you, how do these guys compare? So we just did, I'm going to show you the same kind of data, but the attention scores for all the groups except for the green laptop group were here, uh, about 6.3 or so uh, attention trials correct. And the kids in the green laptop scored an entire, uh, had an entire, um, one full additional uh, score on the attention tests. Which is once again, that's even a little more than a typical dose of rhythm. So that's a pretty significant increase. Okay, so let me just spend one, two minutes. I was gonna spend one minute. I can see the two. I got two minutes. I'm gonna give you two minutes of implications. So the implications are, I, I think when we started out, I said I, I think this goes beyond high school or students' schools. I, I suggest that these findings have implications for people in hospice and people that grew up in poverty. I, I think it has implications for students, certainly, of various ages, uh, for office workers, or for people suffering from cancer, which we know is, you know, people that are in cancer treatments, that's an incredibly cognitively demanding uh, activity. The, our next set of experiments are gonna be looking at people's brains and the impact of green spaces on brains. This is an EEG. Uh, that um, we've just started to do an experiment with. We're also using high functional magnetic resonance imaging systems. This, this is my brain. Um, we did a pretest a few weeks ago in which we're, we're putting people in these high definition fMRIs and we're taking pictures of their brains before and after they've had stressful experiences and then again after they've seen uh, videos of urban green spaces the kind of urban green spaces that you promote every day. We're going to see if we can have identify measurable impacts on uh, cognitive function through, through these tools. So that's what's next. I just published a, a chapter about the topics I'm talking about today. It's in this book, Fostering Reasonless Supportive Environments for Bringing Out Our Best. It's uh, edited by Kaplan and Basso. It's, uh, it's, it, it's produced by the University of Michigan Press. The good news about it is if you type in my name and fostering reasonableness, you will get, you can go to the website and, do, and download the chapter for free. You don't have to buy the book. I would love to have you buy the book, but you can read the chapter for free if you'd like. Okay, the next thing I want to do is suggest that you need to take action. And I know that many of you are doing this already. You know, great, one, this is, uh, this is the formal uh, mixed field in, um, in Chicago, it's, it's uh, called uh, Northerly Isle now. It's a great park. It's, one of the, it's going to be one of the world's great parks. Great, huge parks are a, a important, an important and critical part of wonderful cities. Great cities have great parks, but they're not enough. It's not enough to have a great park. You have to have access to green space outside your classroom, outside your home, outside your office. So finding ways to integrate um, green spaces into cities 
um, along bike paths and along routes to school is super important. And we've done that in, in, in some cities, but we need to do a much, much, much better job in many places. Another thing that we need to do is we need to find ways to connect our green spaces so that we can create opportunities for people to walk and ride their bikes and have green connected corridors within our communities. Because when we do so, we provide all kinds of benefits to human beings and the environment that take advantage of the kinds of things that we've been talking about here today. Let me leave you with one final comment. And I, I know that this motivates Shannon, I know this motivates you and your people every day. What we actually need, and what we need to work together towards, is to have nature at every doorstep. Thank you so much. Yeah.